Hey, good afternoon, brothers and sisters. I want to walk you back to a beacon of light. It is still Sunday, February 16th, and it is about 3.31 p.m. Right now, I'm sitting at the park with my Joshua as he plays, runs around, and gets tired. And uh, I brought my Bible, and I wanted to read 1 Timothy chapter 2. You know, there's a lot of good of a, a lot of good meat in this uh, chapter. A lot of good things that uh, we can take from it and apply to our lives. And uh, the study that we had today at House of Rest Church about us being a vessel for the Lord. You know, we we not only receive our shipment, we not only fill up our vessels at church. We can also fill up our vessel every time we get into God's Word. You know, uh, because every sermon, every Bible study, every fellowship, every get-together that we have as Christians is based on the Bible. You know, that's a little encouragement that uh, you don't have to wait for Sunday service. You should be filling up and eating God's Word every day, every moment you can. So let's go ahead and jump right into it, brothers and sisters. 1 Timothy chapter 2. The title here is Pray for All Men. It says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks may be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. And peace... Hold on. That we may live, and we may lead, lead a quiet and peaceable life in our godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath and doubting. In like manner also the, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a, look, let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved from childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Now right off the bat, we see that uh, Paul is making a command to pray for all men. Those kings and those in authority you know, and, and we know, as we look at the world today, that not all people who are in authority are godly men. Not people who are rulers are believers. They are non-believers as well. It says here in the footnote, Here, Paul elaborates on what will build up the church. In these verses, Paul uses four of the seven New Testament terms for prayer, supplications, which emphasizes our personal need. The verb from which the noun is derived has the idea of petition. Prayers is the general word for prayer. The term is always directed toward God with reverence and worship. Intercessions means approaching with confidence suggesting free access to God. Giving of thanks is an attitude of gratitude. The act of praising God for what he has done for us, each of these aspects of prayer 
should be included in the prayer life of a church. For all men is the first object of prayer. This generic expression for male and female alike cannot be restricted to believers. It also includes non-believers, such as kings and all who are in authority. Peaceable refers to internal composure or an amiable attitude. The idea of praying for kings has a twofold emphasis. First, it is a specific way to pray for all men because the actions of a king affect society as a whole. Second, it reminds believers that God is the ultimate sovereign. He is in control and our prayers affect decisions at the highest level. In verse 2 4, he says, Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? Who desire all men to be saved does not mean that God has willed that everyone should come to salvation, for everywhere, Paul clearly teaches that only those who believe in Christ will receive salvation. This is also the clear teaching of Jesus in John 3, 15 through 18. Thus, universal salvation is not the determinative will of God by which he sovereignly rules the world. Instead, what Paul might be saying here is that the Savior God extends the offer of salvation to all. Hey, brother. How's it going? Bible study going on. Yep. Oh, yeah. Recording on YouTube. Hey, little man. God bless you. Oh, yeah. Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse is cool. To you? Uh, it's called it's called a beacon of light. Yeah. Yeah, we're through we're through House of Rest Church in Modesto. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've been doing my studies too, man. So I'm going through a lot right now, so I gotta keep him close to me. So check out the channel, brother. I will. What's your name? Anthony. Anthony, mine's Anthony as well. Oh, there you go. Yeah, go ahead and lift up in prayer, brother. That's little Anthony right there. Hey, little Ant. Damien and my wife on here. All right. Nice to meet you guys. God bless. Amen to that. The knowledge of the truth refers to Christian growth after being saved. God's desire is not only our salvation, but also our growth in the truth, so that we will not be led astray by false teachers. You know, it's, it's important for us, if you don't want to be led astray by a false teacher, it's important for you to get into your word. It's important to you to, to open up God's Bible and learn what your identity is in his kingdom who you are in Christ what you do reflects on who you will become you know what Pastor David said today about us being a vessel and sometimes that vessel can be filled with garbage it's, it's really important that you fill your life that you fill your heart and that you fill your mind with godly things amen to that finding truth in God's word All right, so from verse 8 to 15, it talks about things, about men and women. And we're going to see what Thomas Nelson breaks it down with. It says, the men refer to those involved in leading public worship. Leadership in public worship is not restricted to elders or those with specific gifts. Prayer is one of the central features of Christian worship. The Greek word translated men in this verse refers to males distinguished from females. Some have insisted that this means that males are to be the only leaders in public worship. On the other hand, Paul describes women as praying in public in some of his other letters. You can see this in uh, verse 9 or 1 Corinthians 11.15. It says, lifting up holy hands. Lifting up holy hands is a Hebrew way of praying. See 1 Kings 8.22. Without wrath and doubting. Wrath is a slow, boiling type of anger. Doubting literally means to think backwards and forward. It carries the idea of disputing. Prayer is to be offered without resentment or disputing among those in the church. If believers do not have good relations with others in the church, they should not lead in public worship. 
chapter 2, verse 9. It says, In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly clothing. In like manner also, this expression probably continues the, the discussion of prayer begun in verse 8. In other words, when men pray, they are to possess sincere and holy attitudes. When women pray, they should be modest. Modest apparel. The emphasis is that women should dress appropriately when at worship and not put on extravagant clothes that draw attention to themselves. Propriety means reverence and respect, shrinking away from what is inappropriate. Moderation may also be translated sound judgment or self-control. So you see here, uh, Paul is talking about worship. You know, when, you're, when you have a worship leader, you don't want to put on a, a show as to be men pleasers, but you want to dress in moderation and, and act in, in a self-control and be mindful that uh, we're there to represent God. We're there to worship the Lord. We're there to put on a show for God, but he wants us to be modest while doing it. In verse 11, it says, let a woman learn is a command. Paul ignored popular myths about women being incapable of learning and urged Timothy to provide opportunities for women to be educated. In silence refers to the woman's attitude or manner while learning, as should be true of all believers. Paul was not saying that a woman cannot speak in the local assembly. See 1 Corinthians 11, 2-16. He was simply cautioning women to learn with an attitude of all submission and not in an unruly manner. Verse 12, to teach. Paul uses a Greek word that indicates the type of teaching that was found in the Jewish communities and synagogues from which he had come. Such teaching was built on the revelation of God and assumed that there would be some sort of oversight like that exercised in the early church by the elders. Generally, those who exercised this responsibility in the early church had the spiritual gift of teaching. But not every gift of teaching was necessarily to be exercised over the entire congregation. The word or seems to be indicated that teach is defined by the phrase have authority over a man. It seems best to understand this passage as teaching that women may exercise their spiritual gifts in a variety of ministries in a local assembly. You can see 2 Timothy 3.14 or Titus 2, 3-4. As long as those gifts are exercised under the appropriate leadership of men, other com commentators have viewed this verse as an example of Paul using his apostolic authority to curb the spread of Ephesus of false teaching that apparently was becoming popular among some women who had not been properly instructed. So you see, this is why churches need to be in order, why there should be uh, proper leadership and not just people doing their own thing, you know, but we must all follow the, the, the guidelines and the laws that are written in God's word. Before we close, I want to uh, read this little box. It's called A New Way of Worship. What is the proper way to worship God? For those who had grown up in the religious climate of Ephesus before the gospel, Christian worship called for altogether different behavior than they were used to practicing. So Paul offered guidelines for worship to the men and women in the Ephesian church. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8-15. through 15. Ephesus was world-renowned known, world renowned for its magnificent temple of Diana, Artemis. Pagan cults flourished there, along with occult practices. In fact, books with magic, recipes, came to be known as Ephesian books. Nevertheless, the gospel bore great fruit there, and the community of believers grew rapidly. Yet some of the new converts brought their old way of life into the church and began teaching other doctrines. When it came to worship, many were used to wild rites and festivals. Ephesian women were particularly unacquainted with 
public behavior, having been executed for the most part from public gatherings except pagan rituals. So Paul described the correct way of worship. Men, who were apparently given to anger and doubts, needed to stop wrangling and start praying. Likewise, women needed to focus on godliness and good works rather than clothing, jewelry, and hairstyles. And because some were apparently disruptive, they needed to practice restraint. Not necessarily complete silence, but quietness, as the word is translated in 2 Thessalonians 3.12. Since they likely participated in the prayers and other expressive parts of the worship gatherings, compare 1 Corinthians 11.5 and Ephesians 5.19. Today, today the message of Christ continues to attract people from a variety of backgrounds. Some, like the Ephesians, need to learn for the first time about worshiping God. Others bring cultural norms and expectations that are worth using in the worship experience. So as long as they preserve biblical guidelines, such as those that Paul gave to the Ephesians. Amen to that. You know, there's no doubt that, uh, that this is right on the money. Uh, let's go ahead and, uh, and use this. I hope that uh, these verses touch somebody. You know, it, it gives me a lot to think about, you know, that where I can apply God's word to my life and make my life a better, more understandable uh, worship as I go up to him in his house or in my house. When I wake up in the morning and I, and I look to God, it gives me a better understanding of, of who I'm worshiping and how to worship. So I'm going to go ahead and close there, you know, uh, Hope you guys learned something, as I did too. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pray with Brother Anthony right here behind me. And uh, I'll go ahead and see you guys tomorrow. God bless.